I've got a Hudson Bay Gourget. And how much you want for it? Uh, probably about 100000 You know, um, I think it's worth a lot less, like 99000 less. What the f are you talking about? Um, I'd offer you a thousand bucks. I don't know what you're smoking, man, but that's not gonna work. That guy, I think he just thinks I'm some punk kid and wanted to lowball me. Good day, folks. Here are the moments when Pawn Stars experienced some pretty heated exchanges. Onyx diamond spectacles. Sweet. Any idea what you want for them? Five thousand dollars. How's that? Ten grams of platinum there, and some very inexpensive stones. So, what do you think they're worth? Seven or eight hundred bucks. Seriously? Yeah. I've seen similar ones online valued at $5,000. Is that what they want for them, or is that what they're selling them for? Angry man walks away after failing to get asking price for the Pez collection. A guy tries to sell Chum Lee and Corey a collection of Pez candy dispensers. He shows off all of the unique pieces and claims some go for at least $400 a piece on the internet. You got any candy? No. These are all from the 1960s. What good are candy dispensers without candy? Come on, man. You work with this guy. Seems like this is something the kids would be into collecting, man. There's definitely money into it. I have cash for the friendly ghost in the original box goes for like three to four hundred dollars. I have the Mickey Mouse is the original Batman, very tough to find. When the seller asks for twenty five hundred dollars, Corey tells him their best offer is one thousand. I like to grab twenty five hundred for him. Not to grab it somewhere else. I'm gonna offer you a grand, my friend. I can't believe one of them guys offered me a thousand dollars for fifty pieces of Pez. That's an insult to the Pez community. I can't believe it. When Corey rejects the man's counter offer of two thousand, he walks away in a huff. He claims the pair are trying to lowball him because the collection looks kiddish. Man tries to sell salesman copy of 1995 Atlanta Braves World Series ring worth two grand for 13 grand. The client offers Chum Lee and Corey a 1995 World Series ring. As usual, Corey is eager to buy up any sports memorabilia he comes across. Team of the 90s finally won World Series in 95. They're like the Buffalo Bills of the 90s, man. They just couldn't <laughs> pull it off. I'd like to sell it because my wife and I were moving to Vietnam. Was Turner the staff member? He was the owner. This belonged to Ted, and he issued it or gave it away. It could make it worth more. There's a pretty big difference when it comes from staff to player rings. Everybody wants a player's ring because it was a by a guy who actually won the World Series. I'd like to get 13000 for it. You mind if I have a buddy come down and take a look at it? How come? I'd like to get the money and, and get out of here. I'm gonna offer you four grand because it's a staff ring. My guy might come in and tell you it's worth a little bit more. Ah, right, that's fair. When the seller asks for thirteen grand, he suggests bringing in an expert before buying the ring. The seller agrees to wait for the expert because he finds out the ring may be worth more than the four grand. Jeremy, the sports expert, gives them the ring's background and evaluates it. Let's take a look at the ring here. We have a large diamond set on top of a blue stone, and we're gonna have 18 smaller diamonds surrounding it. The company Jostens, they made the rings. So on the inside, we should see the Jostens logo. What do you see? Unfortunately, this isn't even a staff ring. This is what they call a salesman sample. The inside of the band it does not have the Jostens logo. They still do have value. People just want to own a piece of the 95 Braves. With the original box and everything, you're looking at around two grand. Unfortunately, Jeremy discovers that the ring is not original. It is a salesman copy, a type of ring that was presented to the team for approval before the actual rings were forged. The value of the ring plummets from 13K to 2,000. They bring some bozo off the street. I don't know where he came from. All of a sudden, he's Mr. Expert on baseball. So. I I was really disappointed. I would offer you around eight hundred dollars for it. Ah, oh, that's okay. You know, I'll, I'll just take it home. I've learned my lesson. I'm not bringing any more rings into this shop. The devastated owner is shocked at the new value and rejects an offer of eight hundred dollars. Outside the shop, he vows never to try selling another ring to the silver and gold pawn shop. Sulky kid tries selling a Hudson Bay gorget for one hundred thousand dollars. A young man shows Rick a 1700s Hudson Bay gorget that he claims is worth 100 grand. Soldiers wore gorgets to protect themselves against a knife or arrow thrust to the neck. I've got a Hudson Bay gorget. Hey Rick, what the hell's a 4J? <laughs> I don't know a whole lot about it. My dad actually got it. He you already paid for it? A second mortgage on his house. Okay. It was to defend against a knife thrust or a sword thrust to your neck. It looks like it made a, might have been a trade piece to the Indians. The glass beads is completely normal. They had to trade the Indians something for this. And how much you want for it? Uh, probably about 100000 You know, um, I don't see that happening. Why not? I think it's worth a lot less. How much less? Like 99000 less. 
I can tell you right now it's not 1700s. This yellow gray patina that's on it tells me right away it's nickel silver. They're right around 20% zinc. Rick tells the kid that the gorget cannot be from the 1700s because it contains a nickel silver alloy that had yet to be invented. He reckons it was a trade piece to the Indians because it has beautiful Phoenician glass. The zinc wasn't isolated really until the 1800s. What the f are you talking about? Son, I, you're way out of line. I've seen auctions for these things, and they generally go for right around 1,500 bucks. Um, I'd offer you a thousand bucks. I don't know what you're smoking, man, but that's not gonna work. All right, have a nice day. F that guy. I think he's just thinks I'm some punk kid and wanted to lowball me. When Rick offers the kid one grand because the gorgets retail at about 1500, the kid is so shocked that he resorts to colorful language. The old man immediately intervenes and asks the customer to stay in line. The angry kid carries his gorget and protests that Rick wants to scam him because he looks like some punk kid. Delusional man tries to sell fake 1888 Perseus and Pegasus statue by Emile Picard for $6,000. When a guy tries to force Rick to buy a Perseus and Pegasus statue that he has condemned as fake, the old man has to intervene. This is a statue called Pegasus, and this is Perseus. Perseus was the mythological figure that killed Medusa, and the helmet he's wearing right here made him invisible. You got me. I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> If this is a genuine Picault, we're talking thousands of dollars. His sculptures are highly collectible. What doesn't look right is there's some pity right here. If it's an original, the casting will all be right. I believe this was recast probably around 40, 50 years ago, long after Picault died. Things had started well enough. The man had brought in the statue and listened patiently as Rick schooled him on Greek mythology. It says made in USA. This was not made in 1888. The original was made in 1888. I don't believe you. I see this all the time. I tell them it's not real, and they just think I'm a tall. Everything was going okay until Rick claimed the statue was a fake reproduction, not a Picard original, as the seller claimed. I don't care what you tell me, but I know you're full of It's all right, Antoine. I got it. I got it. Um, that's just what I see. I'm glad he didn't want to buy. This is his loss, not mine. The man begins shouting and cursing at Rick. He gets so belligerent that security approaches. Fortunately for the crazy customer, the old man cooled attention before security took the dispute to a physical level. Corey saves the day after Rick almost passes on chic 18th century Onyx diamond flip glasses. Vital offers Corey and Chum Lee a pair of ornate platinum and diamond spectacles. A magnifying glass. No, it's better than that. Bam! Onyx diamond spectacles. Sweet. God, are these platinum? Platinum onyx with diamonds in them. You really need platinum, sapphire, and diamond reading glasses at night? <laughs> Any idea of what you want for them? $5,000. How's yeah. that? I think there's definitely something here. But since I've never seen a pair before, it's worth asking for a second opinion. The guy wants five grand, and Corey calls Rick for a second opinion. Rick inspects the sunglasses and identifies them as from the 1920s. Things, however, take a downturn from there. Generally, jewelry from this time period of this quality is worth a lot of money. Good. But technically, this isn't jewelry. Um, 10 grams of platinum there, and some very inexpensive stones. So what do you think they're worth? Seven or eight hundred bucks. Seriously? Yeah. Rick confirms that though jewelry from that era is quite expensive, the spectacles do not count as jewelry and may not fetch as much. They told me they were worth seven to eight hundred dollars. I was a little bit disappointed. I honestly thought they were more valuable than that. I've seen similar ones online valued at five thousand dollars. Is that what they want for them or is that what they're selling them for? Spectacles aren't used by a lot of people today, so they're basically worth the raw materials. The seller is stunned to hear Rick proclaim the glasses to be worth about eight hundred dollars. When Rick walks away, Corey decides to negotiate with the seller because he unlike Rick, actually knows how hot antique jewelry is. Give me 850, I'll leave a happy man. I feel a lot better about these now that my dad looked them over, but I think he might have lowballed a little bit. 850, come on. It's a win-win situation, don't you think? I'll give you the 850. Good now, the seller asks for 850, and Corey decides to take the risk and buy the cool vintage glasses behind Rick's back. Stubborn guy insists on getting one million dollars for a fake photo of Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln. When a guy shows up at the gold and silver pawn shop to sell his photo of Abraham and Mary Lincoln, even Chum Lee gets suspicious. I thought Abe only took photos by himself. What are you talking about? Well, he's right about that. Okay. All right. It's an ambrotype. You know what that means? It took like 30 minutes to develop and they had to like 
be fixed straight. It was the way photographs were done. It took a long time to expose it. They would have hooks on the wall that would go around like that. You had to push your head into for at least five seconds. Mary was quite the shopper. I could relate to her. No. They were going to get married in 1840. But it was like, no, you'd be spinning too much, girl. I, I don't like, know where you get your history from. How much do you want for this? One in a million, so I'm asking a million. Whoa. The seller claims to have gotten the photo from a collector who sold him a collection of 11 unidentified photographs. When Rick hears that the seller identified the photo himself, he decides to bring in an expert. You have to look at everything in the photograph from what they're wearing to what type of picture it is. You can see that his nose is a little bit different, his eyes are a little bit different. But he had a nose that was crooked, and it definitely has one in this photo as well. There's another thing we can look at, facial comparison software. This woman has sort of a uh, different eyebrows. Rick's expert, Maureen, examines the photograph and identifies certain flaws that guarantee the photo is not of Abraham and Mary Lincoln. When Maureen details the photo's identity, the seller tries to discredit the expert. Well, I don't want to be difficult here. I look for other things besides just face. I look at the clothes, I look at the background, I check. Yes, so do I. <laughs> okay. It's your career. You have a right to discredit yourself. Okay, so you heard Maureen. All right, I appreciate it. Like I said, we can agree to disagree? Yeah, thank you very much. I All appreciate right. it. Have thank a good one, Claire. The deluded man refuses to accept the news. Maureen tries to defend her professional opinion, but the seller keeps ripping into her, claiming that he, too, will be an expert in 10 years. After watching the exchange in shock, Rick decides to believe the expert over the unreasonable seller. Man loses his mind on discovering he bought a fake flintlock for $800. A guy brings Corey a flintlock pistol he considers the cream of his collection. He tells Corey that his wife is making him sell it. His asking price is one grand. After they shoot something, and they flip it around and use this to smash somebody in the head. It's got a lot of history to it. I think it's a really good gun. My wife is, uh, it's kind of pushing me for it. You know, it kills me to sell it, I, but I either got to get rid of the gun or the wife. Yeah, man, some people would choose to get rid of the wife. I'd like to get a grand out of it. I, I think it's worth it. Corey agrees that the gun could be worth the amount if it's real. Not willing to take the risk, Corey calls an expert before talking numbers. What do you think it's worth? If it's authentic and, you know, to the period, anywhere between 15 and 2,500. You would expect to see all the metal uh, heavily pitted. There's no, you know, apparent major pitting or damage. The expert examines the gun and declares it is not genuine. The stunned customer wants to know how the expert arrived at that conclusion. Unfortunately, right off the bat, I know that this is, unfortunately, a reproduction. Um, okay, so, so how can you tell? The markings were, you know, punched in as opposed to hand engraved. You would have certain markings on the barrel that were proof marks. So. How much is this thing worth? About 75 to to $100. The seller shakes his head and asks how much the gun could be worth. He launches an expletives when he learns that he wasted $800 on a gun worth 100 at best. Yeah, so, okay, maybe the thing is a, is a fake. I... My wife was pissed uh, when I bought this gun. Now she's really gonna kill me. Corey pities the guy, but can only advise him to get authentication papers the next time he spends money on such items.